So we learned last week that Hebrew is a unique language. We saw that, number one, there is an intrinsic relationship, an intrinsic connection between Hebrew words and the things they describe. These are not arbitrary designations. All other languages, the words that we use are essentially conventional or arbitrary. We use the word chair for what you're sitting on, but there's nothing intrinsic that connects a chair to the word chair. You could have called it something else and the world will still continue to run. Uh, so we saw that in Hebrew, there's an equivalence between words and things. And as a point of fact, the Hebrew word for word, davar, also means thing. The thing is the word. The word is the thing. Secondly, we saw last week that letters in Hebrew are not just symbols for sounds that we make, but the Hebrew letters have deep and profound spiritual significance. Every single letter has very, very specific meaning, and these meanings of the letters are reflected in the names of the letters, their sounds of the letters, the shapes of the letters, the numerical value of the letters, as well as a number of other factors. There were two Israeli scientists who have recently and independently of each other made amazing discoveries about the shapes and sounds of the Hebrew letters. Chaim Yaakov Guggenheim is an electronics engineer, and he was intrigued by the Bible statement that when the Jewish people heard God speaking at Mount Sinai, it says in the book of Exodus, chapter 20, verse 14, that they saw the sounds. We didn't just hear the sounds of the revelation, we actually saw the sounds. And Jakob Guggenheim was very intrigued by this. He was aware that today we have sophisticated software that can transform sound waves into images that can be displayed on a computer monitor. And what he wanted to verify was the Jewish teaching that the sounds of the letters correspond to their shape. And so he put the letters by pronouncing them, he pronounced each one of the Hebrew letters, and the sound of the pronounced letter formed an image on the computer screen. He discovered that the sound waves for 17 of the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet create an on-screen image that is very similar to the shape of the written letter. It would be like me saying W, and then the computer program, the software, transforming my pronunciation of the letter W, that sound, into a shape. And if it would actually give you the shape of a letter W. Well, that's what happened with almost all the letters in the Hebrew alphabet. Another physicist in Israel, Chaim Elbiz, who works in, his, in Israel's aircraft industry, used software to visually display the pronunciation of the Hebrew letters. And again, there was a remarkable similarity between the shapes generated by pronouncing the letters and the written forms of the letters themselves. We also learned last week that the Hebrew letters are the building blocks of creation, that God created the world with the Hebrew letters as he spoke the world into existence. The Bible tells us that God said, let there be light, and there was light. And so with the three letters that form the Hebrew word light, Aleph, Vav, Resh, Or, those three letters, the permutation of those letters, the order of those letters, basically capture the will of God that's responsible for producing light. Our letters in the Hebrew alphabet essentially express the will of God. That is the foundation of all existence. <clears throat> now, last week we studied the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, which is the letter Aleph. Actually, last week, the letter Aleph that we projected on the screen was the kind of Aleph that you would see printed in, in a Hebrew book. This is the shape of the Aleph as it appears in a Torah scroll. It's pretty similar. And what we learned last week was that the name of the letter Aleph, 
the sound that the Aleph makes, the numerical value of Aleph, the shape of the letter, its first appearance in the Bible at the beginning of a word, and a number of other factors that we use to determine the meaning of letters all point to the fact and reveal that the letter Aleph represents God and godliness. That is the significance of this letter. <clears throat> this is the word on top, Adam. Adam means man or human. And we saw that last week how man's dual nature is reflected in this word. For example, the Aleph, which we just saw the first letter, don't forget Hebrew goes from right to left. So the Aleph, which is in blue, Aleph stands for godliness or God, and that represents the spiritual nature, man's godly soul. That's the spiritual part of the human being. And then the two letters, Dalet and Mem, spell out Dam, which is blood, and that reflects, that stands for the physical aspect of the human being. Human beings are both physical, we were created from the dust of the earth, and spiritual, God breathed the breath of life into us, which is our divine spiritual soul. And we saw that this part of the human being, our physical part, which is reflected in these letters Dalet and Mem, Dalet and Mem are the two letters in Hebrew for four, Dalet, and Mem, 40. So Dam is equal to 44 numero numerologically, and that is equal to the two words for father and mother, Av in Hebrew, Aleph, Bet. Aleph is one, Bet is two, so the word for father is three. And Aim, mother, is Aleph, one, and Mem is 40, 41. So 41, mother, and three, father, is 44. So again, the mother and father basically are what contribute that physical part to the human being, which is the Dam part, the 44 part. What's interesting is that each person has 22 pairs of chromosomes in each cell. We have, people usually say, no, there are 23. But if you look at this chart, there are actually 22 pairs of chromosomes. The chromosomes, both for men and women, are all essentially pretty much the same. But there's a, one other set of chromosomes, which is the 23rd set, which is used to determine a person's sex. So aside from that set of chromosomes determining our gender, we have a set, a pair of 22 pairs of chromosomes, which basically are 44 chromosomes. That interestingly corresponds to that number 44, which is that physical part of the human being. Now, we're going to look tonight at the Hebrew word for truth. <clears throat> this is on the bottom of the slide, and the Hebrew word for truth is emet, or if you pronounce it like an Ashkenazic Jew would, emes, but we'll use the emet pronunciation. So emet is the word for truth, and what's interesting is that it is similar in structure to the word for the human being, adam. They each begin with an aleph, which is that spiritual, divine, godly part, and if we look at the numerical value of the letters, so again, Aleph is one. We saw that in the word Adam, the Dalad is four, the Mem is 40. But in Emet, the word for truth, we have one. But then we have Mem, 40, and Tuf, which is the letter for 400. So Adam is one, four, and 40. Emet, truth, is one, 40, and 400. Very similar. Another similarity is that when you take away the aleph, the godly part of each of these words, so if you take away the aleph from the human being, remove that spiritual divine spark from the human being, all you're left with is dam, is blood. And if you remove the aleph, the godly divine spark from truth, you're left with met, which means dead or death. So the words have a similar structure. Now, the prophet Jeremiah says in chapter 10, verse 10, that God is truth. Very famous verse in the prophet Jeremiah, God is truth. And what I wanted to look at is how do we see truth being connected to godliness? So the numerical value of truth, again, is Aleph 1, 
Mem 40, Tuf 400. So truth is 441. On the bottom of the slide, we have what we learned last week is one of the ways that God describes himself. When Moses comes to God and says, look, you want me to go to the Jewish people and tell them that God's taking them out of Egypt, what if they ask me your name? That's Moses' question. And God says to Moses, my name is Eye Asher Eye. I will be what I will be. Now here, the word Eye in Hebrew is Aleph 1, He 5, Yud 10, and He 5 for 21. And so you can look at this expression of Eye Asher Eye as 21 squared, 21 times 21, and 21 times 21, interestingly, is 441. So you, hear, you see here a connection between God, Eya Asher Eya is one of God's names, and the value of 21, of Eya, times 21 is 441, which is also the value of Emet, the word for truth. It's interesting that this number 21 is also found in many other places. The three patriarchs are Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So if you take the first letter of each of their names, the first letter of Avraham, Abraham is Aleph, the first letter of Yitzhak is Yud, and the first letter of Yaakov is Yud. Yud is the tenth letter, that's the number 10. You have 10, 10, and Aleph is 1, 21. The patriarchs have this abbreviation of their names adding up to 21. Also, what's very interesting is we have a verse in the book of Psalms, chapter 119. This is the longest chapter in the Bible. Chapter 119 in the book of Psalms has 176 verses. So in the verse number 160, the verse begins, Rosh Devarcha Emet, that the beginning of your words are truth. Or another way of translating it is, your very first utterance is truth. Now, how do we see this reflected in the number 21 and godliness? So, um, before we get to the godliness, I'm sorry. Where do we see this idea reflected that the beginning of your words, God, are truth? So, if we go to the five books in the five books of Moses, we have Bereshit. This is the first word of the first book. The first word in the book of Genesis is Bereshit, in the beginning. The first word in the second book of the Bible, the book of Exodus, is Ve'ela, and these. The first word in the third book of the Bible is Vayikra, and he called. The first word in the fourth book of the Bible is V'yadaber, and he spoke. And the first word in the fifth book of the Bible, Dvarim, is Ela, these. If you take the first letter of each of these words, you get base in Bereshi, that's two. The vav in ve'ela, vayikra, and vayadaber, there are three vavs. Vav is the number six, so three times six is 18, plus the two for the bait in Bereshi is 20, and the aleph in ela is 21. So when the book of Psalms tells us that the beginning of God's words are truth, Rosh Devarcha Emet, we see here a connection because, again, this number 21 is a number that's connected to truth, and so the beginning of God's words have this value of 21. Another connection between truth and the beginning of God's words, these are the first three words in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, the first three words of the Bible. Bereshit bara Elohim, in the beginning God created. So the Balaturim, one of the commentaries to the Torah, points out, if you take the last letter of each of these words, you get the three letters that make up the word emet, truth. So again, this illustrates this idea of rosh devarcha emet, the beginning of your words are truth. Now, one of the things we're going to look at more deeply is the word emet, truth, and its counterpart, sheker, falsehood. Let's look a little bit more deeply into this word, emet, for truth. It's actually a very fascinating word. One of the things that we notice about the word emet, the top of the slide, 
is that it begins with the first letter of the alphabet, Aleph. It ends with the last letter of the alphabet, Tuf. And the middle letter is the middle letter of the alphabet, meaning when something is true, it's true from the beginning to the end all the way through. It's consistent. It's truth all the way through, 100%. Another thing about the word emet is that there's an expression that we have in the Talmud. We actually have the same expression in English and probably other languages. The Talmud says that when something is true, yesh raglayim ledavar. It has feet. When something is true, it has feet. We say in English, it has a leg to stand on. You'll notice that the, two, that the three letters in emet each have a base of two points. The aleph stands on two points, the mem stands on two bases, and the tuf stands on two bases. And then there's something else which is fascinating about the word emet truth. Again, we saw that the value of emet is 441. Again, aleph is 1, mem is 40, tuf is 400. But if you add those numbers together, 441, you get 4 plus 4 plus 1 is 9. And 9, as we'll see tonight, is the number of truth. 9 is the number that always corresponds to truth. Here's one reason why. Take any number and multiply it by 9, and you'll find something fascinating. So, for example, 9 times 2 is 18. 1 plus 8 is 9. 9 times 3 is 27. 2 plus 7 is 9. 9 times 4 is 36. 3 plus 6 is 9. 9 times 5 is 45. 4 plus 5 is 9. 9 times 6 is 54. 5 plus 4 is 9. 9 times 7, 63. 6 plus 3 is 9. 9 times 8, 72. 7 plus 2 is 9. 9 times 9, 81. 8 plus 1 is 9. And just to try out to see if this works in real life, so I picked at random the number 389. And I multiplied 9 times 389, and I got 3,501. So 3... 5 and 1 adds up to 9. You could try it with any number on the planet, any number multiplied by 9. If you add the digits up from that number, it'll be 9. And so one thing about truth is that truth is consistent. Truth never wavers. Now we're going to see, on the other hand, that the word for falsehood is the exact opposite. First of all, the letters in falsehood sheker are not spread out in the beginning, the middle, and the end of the alphabet. The letters kuf, resh, and shin are at the very end of the alphabet. They are the second, the third, and the fourth letter from the very end of the alphabet. So these are letters that require each other. They have to stand together to stand up. They don't stand independently. They have to all bunch together, and they're all at the very end of the alphabet. Also, we saw the expression in Hebrew is that truth has legs, but we say sheker ain raglayim ledavar. Sheker, falsehood, doesn't have a leg to stand on. And you'll notice that the letters in sheker each have a base of just one point. They don't stand on two points. So that's the shakiness of falsehood. And then we're going to see that the letters in sheker equal the number 6. Shin is 300, Kuf is 100, Resh is 200. For a total of 600, if you reduce 600 down, you get 6. And 6 is the number of falsehood. We saw that 9 is the number of truth, 6 is the number of falsehood. How do we see this? So our sages teach us something interesting. The sages ask, why does the Torah begin with the letter bet. Why does the Torah begin with the letter bet? And there are actually numerous reasons that have been offered for this. Michael Alter wrote an entire book called Why Does the Torah Begin with a Bet? An entire book just on this question. And here's one reason that touches on our question of the numbers six and nine. Here you have to, as we say in Yiddish, halt cup. You have to sort of focus for a few seconds. Let's go to truth. <clears throat> the Torah begins with 
the letter bet, which is the number two. The Torah begins with the letter bet, number two. Why? Why begin with the letter bet and not the letter aleph, which is the number one? So if you take the number two and you begin counting in series of three, so two plus three plus four is nine. Take the next three numbers. Five plus six plus seven is 18. One and eight is nine. Take the next three numbers. Eight plus nine plus 10 is 27. Two and seven is nine. Take the next three numbers. 11, 12, 13 is 36. Three plus six is nine. So when you begin with the second letter with the bet and you add up the numbers, you always will hit nine, which is the number of truth. That might be why the Torah begins with the letter bet. What's the problem with Aleph? So if you begin with Aleph 1 and you take these sets of three numbers, so 1 plus 2 plus 3 is 6. 4 plus 6, 5 plus 6 is 15. 1 and 5 is 6. 7 plus 8 plus 9 is 24. 2 plus 4 is 6. 10, 11, and 12 is 33. 3 plus 3 is 6. So when you begin with the number 1, Aleph, you get as a result, the number six, which is the number for falsehood, we didn't want to begin the Torah with that. <clears throat> now we saw that the word for truth, emet, is made up of the first, last, and middle letters of the alphabet. There is consistency to truth. Now there is another fascinating and similar teaching of our sages about this kind of consistency. The Zohar, which is the primary text of Jewish mysticism, the Kabbalah, the Zohar teaches that God and the Torah and Israel are one. That God, the Torah, and Israel are one. Here I have it reversed. God and Israel and the Torah are one. Now let's look at the numerical value of each of these terms. I have here the He, which is the number five, but we saw last week that the ultimate essential name of God is the Tetragrammaton, the four letters Yud, He, Vav, He that we do not pronounce. And we saw last week that those letters add up to 26. So the name of God has the value of 26. Yisrael, Israel, is Yud, 10, Shin, 300, Resh, 200, Aleph, 1, and Lamed, 30, for a total of 541. And Torah is Tuf, 400, Vav, 6, Resh, 200, and He, 5, for a total of 611. Now we're going to work with these three numbers. Interestingly, by the way, just while we're on the number of Torah here, 611, the Talmud in Tractate Makos, 23b, asks us, how do we know there are 613 commandments in the Torah? So they base it upon a verse in Deuteronomy chapter 33, verse 4, which says, Torah tziva lanu Moshe. Moses commanded us the Torah. And we saw the Torah has a numerical value of 611. So the Talmud says, yes, Moses gave us 611 commandments, but two we heard directly from God. If you look at the Ten Commandments, it's interesting that the first two are spoken in the first person. God says, I am the Lord your God, who took you out of the land of Egypt from the house of slavery. The second commandment, you shall have no other gods before me. But the third commandment switches into the third person. Don't take the name of the Lord your God in vain. It doesn't say, don't take my name in vain. And the sages teach us that what happened was, that as the Jewish people were hearing the Torah spoken to them directly by God, they were overwhelmed. It was just too much for them. And they said, Moses, we can't take it anymore. You please get the rest and you are related to us. So the Talmud says that Moses gave us 611, but two we heard directly from God for a total of 613. <clears throat> now what we're going to do is actually quite startling and amazing now. We're going to show again this consistency between these three terms of God, Torah, and Israel, as it stretches across the entire Torah. And what we're going to do now is we're going to take the, the words for God 
and Israel. I have it highlighted for you in blue. God, again, we saw was 26. Israel was 541. If you add that together, you get 567. So the value of God and Israel is 567. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to begin with the first word in the Bible, Bereshit. And you'll notice that the last letter in this word Bereshit is a Tuf. Tuf is the last letter in the Hebrew alphabet. Tuf also is the first letter in Torah. So what we're going to do is starting with this Tuf in the word Bereshit, the last letter of the first word in the Bible, and we're going to go forward 567 letters, counting forward. And guess what letter you're going to hit? Starting with that tough and counting forward 567 letters, you're going to land on the letter Vav, which is the next letter in the word Torah. From that Vav, go forward 567 letters, you're going to hit a resh. And from that resh, go forward 567 letters, you're going to hit a hey. So starting with the last letter in Bereshit, at intervals of 567, which again is the value of God and Israel, it will produce for you the word Torah. And here you see a Torah scroll, and it's, it's, it's rolled to the beginning. On the right-hand side of the first, is the beginning column. And so starting at that first word on the first column, you'll go in sequences of 567, you're going to hit the word of Torah. Now, the second thing we're going to do is take Torah, which is 611, and Israel, which is 541, and we're going to combine them to get 1152, 1152. And here we're not going to start in the beginning of the Torah. Here we're going to go right to the middle letter of the entire five books of Moses. And the middle letter of the Torah is the Vav in the word Gachon. The word Gachon means belly. And it's describing here the kind of crawling creatures that we're not supposed to eat. So we know that the letter Vav is one of the letters in God's name. God's name is again Yud. Hey, Vav, Hey. So starting with that Vav in the word Gachon and going forward 1,152 letters, we're going to get a Hey. If we go backwards 1,152 letters, we're going to get a Hey. And if you go from that Hey back another 1,152, you're going to get a Yud. So again, using the Vav in Gachon as your starting point and going at intervals backwards and forwards from that Vav of 1152, which is the combination of Torah and Israel, you're going to get yud Hey vav Hey, which is God's name. Here, by the way, is a uh, picture of the way a Torah scroll actually looks. And you'll see on the, on the second line... Uh, the second word from the end of the line, you see the word gachon, and the vav there in gachon is written very large because it's pointing out that that's the middle letter of the entire Torah. And then we're going to go to the last word in the entire five books of Moses. The last word in the five books of Moses is Israel. Right? The verse says, that God spoke to Moses in the eyes of all of Israel, the Ene Kol Yisrael. So here we're going to take Israel. The last letter in Yisrael is a Lamed. We're going to take not Israel now, we're going to take a combination of God, Yud Hey Vav Hey, which is 26, and Torah, which is 611. 26 and 611 is 637. And we're going to go backwards now from that last letter in Yisrael, Lamed. And we're going to go back 637 letters and we're going to get an Aleph. And from that Aleph backwards 637, you're going to get a Resh. And from that Resh backwards 637, you're going to get a Shin. And from that Shin backwards 637, you're going to get a Yud. Spells out Yisrael. So when the Zohar says that God, Torah, and Israel 
have a unification, a unity to them, they're one. This exercise illustrates it in a very dramatic and powerful way. Now today was Yom HaAtzma'ut, the Israeli Independence Day, and last week we saw some incredible biblical pointers to the year of the founding of the State of Israel, the modern state, in 1948. One of them we saw was Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 3, which is the 5,708th verse in the Bible. Deuteronomy 33 is verse number 5,708, and it describes how God will ingather the Jewish people from all the lands across the world where he scattered us. 5,708, the Hebrew year 5708, corresponds to the English year 1948. So we saw that Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 3, is an incredible indicator for the year 1948. Also, we saw in the book of Leviticus, chapter 25, verse 13, which describes the Jubilee year when it speaks about in this year of the Jubilee. We saw that was strange. Why does the Bible say in this year of the Jubilee people return to their ancestral lands? It should have just said in the year of the Jubilee. So we saw that the way that word to return is spelt in the Bible, it spells out the year, again, 5,708 for 1948. That specific year is when we will return to our land. But I want to share with you another indicator for 1948 that is quite mind-blowing. <clears throat> the Vilna Gaon, a brilliant 18th century sage, uncovered another reference to 1948 in this passage from the Talmud. The Talmud discusses what happened on the day that Adam and Eve were created. And the Talmud says that, this is Tractate Sanhedrin 38b, the Talmud says that on the first hour, the dust was gathered. God gathered the dust of the earth. In the second hour, an undefined figure was fashioned. In the third hour, his limbs were extended. In the fourth hour, the soul was placed within him. And in the fifth hour, he stood up from the dust. Adam rose up on his feet from the dust. I'll just go through the rest of the hours in case you're interested. In the sixth hour, he named the animals. In the seventh hour, he was paired with Eve. In the eighth hour, they gave birth to Cain and Abel. In the ninth hour, he was commanded not to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. In the tenth hour, they sinned. In the eleventh hour, they were judged. In the twelfth hour, they were expelled. Now, we have a famous verse in the book of Psalms, chapter 90, verse 4, which says, that a thousand years in your eyes, God, are like a day that has just passed. And based upon this verse, there was a famous teaching that the six days of creation parallel 6,000 years of history. There's a teaching that we have that history will last a maximum of 6,000 years. And by the 6,000th year, we will enter into the seventh day, the Sabbath, which represents the messianic age. So the present world order will basically end at the latest by the year 6000. And this is based upon the idea that there were six days of creation. Each day is equal to a thousand years. So we have 6000 years of history followed by the Sabbath day, which parallels the Sabbath messianic age. Now the Vilna Gon basically calculated these years in the following way. He said that Adam, we know, stood up in the fifth hour of the sixth day. So before the sixth day, you had Monday, I'm sorry, you had uh, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. You had five days before the sixth day. And five days, we know, is equal to 5,000 years. If a day is 1,000 years, so those first five days is 5,000 years. But then we have the sixth day, which is Friday. When does Friday begin? It really begins Thursday night. The Jewish days, the Sabbath begins, not Saturday morning, the Sabbath begins Friday night. So the sixth day, Friday, really begins Thursday night at sunset. And so we have from sunset Thursday night until sunrise Friday morning, that's 12 hours. 12 hours would be 500 years 
right? If 24 hours is 1,000 years, 12 hours is 500 years. And then we have five hours into the sixth day, which would be not 6 o'clock in the morning, daybreak, but 11 o'clock in the morning. So if we know, this is simple math, if 1,000 years is 24 hours, how many years is one hour? So you do the conversion, one hour would be 41.6 years, 41.6. So five times 41.6 is 208. So the Vilna Gon said, if you take these years, 5,000 plus 500 plus 208, you get, you get 5,708. The Hebrew year 5,708 we saw was the English year of 1948. Now, what happens in that year? Adam begins to rise up out of the dust. We know that Adam has a connection or correspondence to the Messiah. The Messiah is going to be a descendant of David. And the Midrash teaches us that David was going to be stillborn. David was going to be stillborn. And Adam, so to speak, donated 70 years of his life to David. David lived to be 70 years of age. Adam was supposed to live to be a thousand because God said on the day you eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, on that day you're going to surely die. So Adam should have lived to be a thousand, but he donated 70 years to David. So we know that Adam lived, if you look at Genesis, to be 930 years of age. There's a connection between Adam and the Messiah. Adam, David, Mashiach, so the letters in Adam, the, the, first let, the first line on the slide, Aleph, Adam, Dalid, David, Mem, Mashiach. And these three personalities are all connected. Adam is sort of a prototype for Mashiach, and there's a connection there through David. So according to the Vilna Gaon, according to the Vilna Gaon, what we're learning here is that Adam standing up in the fifth hour of the sixth day teaches us that the beginning of the messianic process, with Adam emerging out of the dust, you could say emerging out of the ashes, because that was 1948, out of the ashes, would take place in the year 5708 or 1948. Now, we're going to share a theory now about Hebrew that is somewhat controversial, but I think is very fascinating. Isaac Moseson has written a number of books putting forth the idea that Hebrew is the source of the languages of the world. He wrote in 1989 a book called The Word, which has over 200 pages of Hebrew word parallels to English and other languages. And then in 2006, he wrote The Origin of Speeches, which further explores his theory called Edenics, which traces language etymologies back to the original language of humanity, which was Hebrew. Now, it says in the book of Genesis, chapter 11, verse 1, that the whole earth was of one language. The whole earth had one language and conforming or uniform words. What was that language? What was the one language that was spoken by the whole world in Genesis chapter 11, verse 1. So, the greatest commentary to the Bible, the premier Bible commentator, is Rashi, Rabbi Shlomo ben Yitzchak. He lived a thousand years ago in France. His commentary to the Bible is so awesome that there are over 500 scholars who dedicated themselves to writing super commentaries to Rashi's commentary. Just think about that for a minute. That's how profound his commentary is. So in Rashi's commentary, he says, what is Safa Achat? Achat, what is the, the one language? Rashi says, Lashon HaKodesh, Hebrew. We saw last week, Lashon HaKodesh means the holy tongue or the holy language, which is the expression we use for Hebrew. So Rashi's telling us that when the Torah tells you that the whole world spoke one language, Rashi says it was Hebrew. Now, you can read this phrase of Safa Achat as one language. You can read it as the language of the one. The language of the one, 
meaning the Torah describes God creating the world using Hebrew words. God didn't say, let there be light in German or in Japanese. He said, let there be light in Hebrew. And so Hebrew is the language of the one, of the creator. Now, in 1980, I was studying in Israel and I had the opportunity to meet the Stipler Gaon, Rabbi Yaakov Yisrael Kanievsky. And in his book called Birchas Peretz, he has a section where he shows numerous examples where the commentary of Rashi, if you take the numerical value of his commentary, which means take Rashi's commentary and add up all the Hebrew letters in his comment and take the numerical value of all those letters, so the stipler shows that the numerical value of Rashi is the same as the numerical value as the words in the Torah he's commenting on. Dozens and dozens and dozens of examples, and this is one of them. The numerical value of Safa Echat and Lashon HaKodesh is essentially the same. It's actually off by one. Uh, Lashon HaKodesh is 795, and Safa Echat is 794, but we have a principle in Gematria that you can add one to a word for the kolel. One is the value of the word itself. So basically, this is an interesting example of how Hebrew is the special language of God. Now, one of the theories of Mosesin is the idea that there were word families. And he finds consistent similarities between Hebrew word families and related families in other languages. So, for example, the first two letters on the top of this slide, on the right-hand side, are Mem and Nun. Mem and Nun. And this is, the name, this, this is basically a family of letters with these two letters in common. I basically have put in red the Mem and Nun in all these different words. Mem and Nun is the word which means min. Min means from. When you have something taken from something else, right? you're taking something from the whole. And basically, min in Hebrew will appear in words dealing with numbering and things that you count, counting and numbering. So, for example, mamon, the second word on the top line, mamon is Hebrew for money. Money is certainly something that's counted. Minyan is a word that means counting or a number of people for a prayer quorum. Hamon in Hebrew, the third line, means many. Limnot means to count. A mana is a portion. So this is a family of words all containing the two letters mem nun. But we'll see that you have the mem nun, the mn family in English as well. So again, mem nun, min in Hebrew means from. From is when again you take something from something else. When you do that, you minus it. When you take something from something else, you minus it. So you have minus, you have diminish, you have many, numerous, money, mammon, mammon is also an English word for mammon, for money, number, amount, all words about counting and numbering with the MN uh, root. So basically what uh, Moses in shows is that the same kind of word families in Hebrew will be replicated in other languages as well. Now, what I want to show you is about 45 examples where Hebrew words are parallel to the English word. Let's begin. The first word on the list is Adon. Adon in Hebrew means a mister or a master or sir. And the English equivalent of Adon would be Adonis, possibly. Adon in Hebrew, Adonis in English. The next word is Atik. Atik in Hebrew means ancient. And in English, Atik sounds very much like antique. So Atik and antique. You're getting the point of this, I hope. The next word down is Ason. Ason is a donkey. Ason sounds very much like the English ass or asinine. Gamal. Well, Gamal is pretty easy. Gamal is camel. So camel is camel. Gamal. There it is not much of a struggle. Charov in Hebrew is carob. Again, charov sounds very much like the English word carob. Our next slide, ikar is the Hebrew word for essence. 
What would be the English equivalent of ikar that sounds like ikar? Core. The core of something is its essence, the ikar, the core. Then we have the word keren, which means corner. Well, keren sounds like corner, and that's what the English equivalent would be. Kefel in Hebrew, the third word down. Kefel in Hebrew means double. And the English equivalent of kefel would be couple. Kefel, couple. Then we have one of my favorite examples, the Hebrew word mifunak. Mifunak is someone that is squeamish. What's the English equivalent of mifunak? Finicky. Someone who's finicky is mifunak. Then we have the Hebrew word perek, which is a portion. Perek, which is a portion. And the English equivalent is fraction. You can see the perek, hey, there can be a, an F sound, by the way. So perek or ferek, fraction. Then we have the word perot, fruit. Well, perot, fruit, is more or less the same word. Maher in Hebrew means quickly. So what would be the English equivalent of maher? Hurry, hurry, maher. Yeled in Hebrew is a lad, and the English would be yeled. I'm sorry, <laughs> I switched it. Yeled is lad. I should have said yeled is child, and the English equivalent is lad, yeled lad. Then we have masecha in Hebrew, which in English is mask, and that's the English equivalent, mask, masecha. And we have the same thing with prat. We saw this last week. Prat is part, and that's the same exact word, part, prat, the Hebrew and the English. Then we have pras, which in Hebrew means a reward, and the English equivalent of pras would be prize. Then we have refes, garbage. So the equivalent of refes would be refuse, right? Refuse. Then we have charat in Hebrew, which means to feel bad. And charat is very similar to the English regret. Charat, regret. Ragil in Hebrew means routine or habitual. And the English of ragil would be regular. And then reshima in Hebrew is a list. But also English could be a resume. Reshima, resume. Then we have Orez in Hebrew, Orez is rice. Orez, rice, rice, same, same sounds. Rechush in Hebrew is treasure, and the English of Rechush could be riches. Rechush, riches. Reeve in Hebrew is a fight or a quarrel, and the English should be a rivalry. Reeve, rivalry. Sagur in Hebrew means closed, and the English equivalent would be secure. Tzad in Hebrew means side, tzad, side, the same exact sounding word in English. Otsar in Hebrew is a treasury, and otsar in English could be a store, otsar, store. Naval in Hebrew is despicable, and the English equivalent could be vile, naval, vile. Zimain in Hebrew, to call up or to convene, zimain could be summon, to summon, zimain. Yilel in Hebrew means to scream, and in English, Yilel would be to yell. Yonake is a nursing baby, and you could say in English it would be young. Then we have Zariz. Zariz in Hebrew is quick with alacrity, and you could say Zariz is zealous. To'eva in Hebrew is a disgusting act, and the English would be to'eva taboo. To'eva taboo. You have to remember that in Hebrew, the V and the B are interchangeable. Then we have trafim, idols or statues. Trafim could be trophies. Trufa in Hebrew is medicine. Trufa could be therapy. Trufa, therapy. Sheish is six. Six is sheish. Then we have chalav, milk, and levan, white. And that's What's the sound for that? Chalav and lavan is albino. Mm -hmm. Lavan, albino for white. Kol in Hebrew means all, same as in English, all, kol. Asham in Hebrew is guilt. And in English, asham could be shame or ashamed. Then or in Hebrew is light, and the English could be aura. Or in Hebrew, aura in English. Derech in Hebrew is a path or a way, and English would be direction, derech, direction. And then finally, the last four, 
Avel in Hebrew means an injustice or a wrong. And we could say in English that's evil. Avel is evil. Pleita in Hebrew is to escape. And in English we could say is to flee. Pleita, again, the P and the F are interchangeable. So pleita, fleita, flee. Goren in Hebrew is a place of threshing or goren granary. And finally, shoresh in Hebrew means source. And shoresh and source sound exactly the same. Now, are these just coincidental? Moses shows thousands of examples. And I think that once you're finding thousands of examples, it becomes difficult to say that something is just a coincidence. Now, we want to conclude tonight with a well-known story from the book of Genesis about Jacob. Jacob is told by his parents to flee from the wrath of his brother Esau and to go to the home of his uncle Lavan. On the way, we know what happens. He beds down in a place to sleep at night. He has a dream of a ladder stretching from the earth up to the heavens with angels going up and down that ladder. According to our sages, the place where he had this dream would be the location where in the future the holy temple in Jerusalem would be built. In Genesis chapter 28, verse 19, we're told that Jacob named this place where he had the dream Bet El, the house of God. But we're told the city's original name was Luz. This is the Hebrew word on the screen, Luz. In English, it'd say L-U-Z. Now, this is a curious detail for the Bible to share. Normally, the Bible doesn't give us sort of uh, geography tidbits that, by the way, the name of the city back in the olden days was something else. So it's interesting that the Bible chooses to tell us that the original name of Bet-El was Luz. What might the significance of this be? So we know that Luz, according to our mystical teachings, the Luz is a bone, it's the name of a bone at the top of our necks that the skull rests on. It's called a Luz bone. And according to our sages, it's the only part of our body that will never disintegrate. And it's from that bone that our bodies will be reconstituted when they are resurrected in the future. That is the significance of the Luz bone. And we're taught by our sages that that bone in our body is nourished from only one thing. It's nourished from the food that we eat at our Malava Malka. The Malava Malka is a meal that is eaten after the conclusion of the Shabbat. Now let's look at this word Luz. The middle letter in Luz is the letter Vav. Let's try to figure out the letter Vav, what it means. In Hebrew, the word vav means a hook. The word vav means hook in Hebrew. And interestingly, the letter vav is shaped somewhat like a hook. Also, the letter vav in Hebrew serves as the conjunctive, meaning vav in Hebrew means and, and. Ani v'ata, I and you, ve, and you. That's what a hook is. A hook combines two things, right? A hook is basically and. It hooks two things together. So that is the significance of the middle letter vav. It's interesting that in the tabernacle in the desert, we're told that there was a curtain that went around the entire perimeter of the tabernacle, around the mishkan. And the curtain was held up by columns. Columns in Hebrew are called amudim. You see on the uh, right-hand side of the slide is an amud, one of these columns. And on the top of the column was a hook. And the hook was what held the curtain in place. And the hook is called a vav. So the hooks of these columns are called the vave ha'amudim. Vave is the construct form. Vave is vavs of the amudim, the columns. So these hooks on top of the columns are called the hooks of the columns, the vave ha'amudim. And this is the way it would have looked in the desert, where you see the curtains 
that are around the perimeter of the tabernacle and the curtains are held up by those columns. Interestingly, in a Torah scroll, Torah text is written in columns. Every single column in the Torah scroll is called an amud, a column. Same word, column. Interestingly, if you look at a Torah scroll, you'll see that almost every column in the Torah scroll begins with the same letter. Almost every single column in a Torah scroll begins with the letter Vav. And those are also called the Vave Ha'amudim. Here it's not the hooks of the columns. Here it's the Vavs of the columns. So we have both the hooks of the columns in the tabernacle and the Vavs of the columns in the Torah scroll. So that's the letter Vav. Now we have the letter Zion. Again, in the word Luz, it's the last letter. Now, the Zion in Hebrew, uh, clay Zion in Hebrew are weapons. Clay Zion are weapons. The Zion, by the way, you'll see is shaped like a sword. It has a handle on top with a sharp point. And again, this is not the kind of Zion you will see in a printed book. This is the kind of Zion you'll see in a Torah scroll because in the Torah scroll, many of the letters have little crowns on top. Those you will not see in a printed book. Now, in Hebrew, Zion doesn't only mean weapon. Zion also has the connotation of food or nourishment. For example, the word zan means to nourish or to sustain. Mazon in Hebrew is food. Now, what's fascinating is that there is a connection between weapons and food. Let's look at an interesting two examples. The word on top is ma'achelet. Ma'achelet is a word that's used in Genesis 22, verse 6, for a knife. We're told that Abraham, when he took his son to the Akedah, his Isaac, to be bound, he took with him a knife. And the Bible describes that knife as a ma'achelet, a ma'achelet. Knife. But you'll see that in the middle of the word ma'achelet are the letters Aleph, Chof, Lamed, which are the words for to eat or food. Ochel is food. So here you see again this pairing between a weapon and food. And then we have the word milchama, the next word down. Milchama is war. But in the middle of milchama is Lamed, Chet, Mem, which is lechem, bread. So we see all these connections between food and weapons and war. What's the connection? Well, we all know the connection. If you study the history of humanity, this is what wars were often fought about, was food, was resources, was economics. The last letter in Luz, actually it's the first letter in Luz, is the Lamed. Now in Hebrew, the word Lamed itself, the name of the letter we saw last week was significant. Lamed in Hebrew means to teach, to learn, to study. That's the meaning of Lamed, is to teach, to learn, to study. A Talmid in Hebrew is a student. Now in Kabbalistic literature, the shape of the Lamed reflects the idea of divine wisdom being channeled down to our world from higher realms. It's almost like... Uh, an eaves trough of a house that brings the water down to the street level. So that's what the Lamed is. A Lamed, the little big piece going up in the sky, is channeling, is bringing down divine wisdom into our world. And what's fascinating about the letter Lamed, I mentioned last week that almost all the Hebrew letters are compounded from other letters. So the Lamed is built from a Chaf, which is the 11th letter in the alphabet, it stands for the number 20. Chaf is the bottom of the Lamed, and coming out of the top of the Chaf is the letter Vav. So here you have a Chaf, which is 20, and a Vav, which is 6. 26, which we've seen a number of times so far, is the number of God's name. Yud, Hey, Vav, Hey is 26. So this is further evidence that the kind of teaching that's going on here is not just 
you know, reading, writing, and arithmetic, but this is divine knowledge, divine teaching. 26 is the number of Hashem, the number of God. Now back to our word luz. Now that we know the meaning of these three letters, what we can see is that the word luz is actually a pictogram. It is an incredible pictogram. And what is it teaching us? It's teaching us that there's a connection, that's vav, between lamed and zayin. Again, vav is the letter of connection. It's the hook. It's the end. And so we have a connection between lamed, which is wisdom and teaching and spiritual knowledge, and zayin, which is physicality, sustenance. Meaning that luz is the connection between the spiritual and the physical. That's what luz is all about. Lamed is spiritual, vav is connection, zayin is physical, and so the word luz connotes the connection between spirituality and physicality. Now let's go back and look at our story. Not the story about Jacob, but the story about the loose bone. So the loose bone we saw is in the neck. The neck is the part of the body that connects our head. The head is the center of our intelligence, our intellect, the center of our spirituality, and the rest of our body, which is the more physical part of who we are. Meaning the neck, the loose, that bone connects the physical to the spiritual. It connects the head to the rest of the body. And this is why the luz will serve as the link between our returning soul and our regenerated body at the resurrection. Because again, the luz is the connection between the physical and the spiritual. So it's from that bone that we have the connection between our physical body that will be regenerated and our spiritual soul that will be returning. What is it that sustains the loose bone? What sustains it? The food that we eat at the Malaval Maka. The meal that's eaten right after Shabbat. Now the Shabbat is a day of pure spirituality. What we do right after Shabbat is that period of time that connects. It's the point of the week between the pure spirituality of Shabbat and the more mundane existence of the other six days of the week. So it's significant that we nourish the loose bone at that point, which is the connection between the spirituality of Shabbat and the more physical, mundane existence of the other six days. Luz was the place where Jacob had his dream of a ladder bridging heaven to earth. Again, the connection between the physical and the spiritual is Luz. And that's going to be the place of the future temple, the holy temple in Jerusalem, because it's the holy temple ultimately that connects our material world to God and to spirituality.